Hey, it's Jeff, and this is a video about learning how to learn. I will provide tools and modalities to optimize neuroplasticity, your brain's ability to develop new neural networks and unwind self-destructive ones. So let's start first with acknowledging that we don't control everything in life. We don't choose our parents, hence we don't choose the underlying nucleotide sequences of our DNA. Uh, we don't choose our environment or our country or the era or the political system into which we are born. Uh, we don't control all the causal chains of events in life that can determine certain realities and we certainly don't have any jurisdiction over randomness. But we do have a good deal of agency and the emerging uh, fields of epigenetics and neuroplasticity really are very optimistic. Um, this idea that our genetic expressions and our brain is not fixed. They're malleable and can change in response to the environment. And of course, we all want to learn and continue to expand and be dynamic and vibrant in life. So I'm going to um, elucidate a number of modalities that explain how new neural networks are formed and how to optimize the creation of new connections and this new kind of rewiring. So we all, of course, want to learn how to play piano or guitar or learn new languages or delve into new fields of study, but it does become more difficult in middle-aged pre-senescence. <laughs> it is true that when you're 25 and younger, your brain is more plastic. It seems like we just kind of absorb these skills uh, through osmosis. But again, there are certain things that we can do to optimize the absorption of information and the development of new skills. And I am living proof. <laughs> and I'll ground this an example because when I was 46 in 2016, in November, I somewhat beleaguerly asked myself, what made America great in the first place? And I'm quite confident there are myriad legitimate answers to this question, but I personally landed on the great American songbook, this canon of tunes written by composers like Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn, Rogers and Hart and Bats Waller. Play a couple Haven or uh, uh, Bewitched. <laughs> now, these timeless songs really brought generations of Americans together, irrespective of color, creed, or religious affiliation. Just people coming together around the old radio or clubs or concerts. Um, and so I assiduously embarked on this folly of trying to learn a new jazz standard every week. And I made it through about 40 weeks, 40 songs, uh, until I drove my family and long <laughs> suffering wife Skylar completely crazy with my incessant uh, clunky plunking night after night. But after about a year, I developed a respectable repertoire that got me a few zero paying gigs <laughs> and might secure my dream retirement gig in some seedy hotel bar. That being said, I presume you have a dream or a quest much more ambitious than me. And so I will explain to you how you might be able to optimize the achievement of that dream. Um, so first, a little bit of basic neuroscience. So like I said, neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to change in response to environment, to rewire itself, to develop new neural pathways or new neural networks. So a little bit first about the nervous system. So the nervous system is your body's command center. It starts in your brain, it's most associated with your brain, and goes down your spinal cord and into your gut. And like I said, it's your command center. It governs thought processing and motor function. 
um, and really mediates a lot of these bodily systems and activities that are happening below the crust of consciousness, like uh, breathing and heart rate and digestion. So the nervous system leverages these specialized cells called neurons. And the neurons send uh, electromagnetic signals, these communiques, uh, to each other and to muscles, etc. And that's kind of how the body functions. Now, there are all sorts of different kinds of specialized neurons. There's motor neurons. Um, there are sensory neurons that help, uh, like for example, the eye take in light through the pupil and refract it through a lens and project it on the back of the retina and, uh, and transmute um, uh, light energy or photon waves into electromagnetic signals that your brain then processes as images. Um, and um, there are uh, certain neurons that help to govern these processes that are happening, like I said, kind of below conscious thought, like digestion and respiration. These automatic um, bodily functions are part of the autonomic nervous system. It basically sounds like what it does. It governs these things that are happening automatically. Now, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two primary sections, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so the parasympathetic nervous system is famously linked to rest and digest. It's your sort of relaxation state. Sometimes after a big meal, it increases gastrointestinal activity, decreases heart rate and respiration. That's balanced by the sympathetic nervous system with its notoriously concomitant with fight or flight or freeze, your body's involuntary uh, response to threat or stressful situations. And obviously this is a hard wired function um, designed for our uh, ancient history on the Serengeti being chased by odd toad ungulates and other beasts. Um, obviously we're not living on the savanna anymore, but we do encounter a lot of psychological threat. So this um, uh, sympathetic nervous system sends blood to your extremities and to your muscles, it increases heart rate, it dilates your pupils, and it reduces digestion or gastrointestinal activity uh, and puts you in that state of fight or flight. Now, these two systems are very associated with a whole variety of neuromodulators or neurotransmitters. Sometimes they're called hormones. Uh, you are probably familiar with some of these, like cortisol or dopamine, others like acetylcholine or um, epinephrine or norepinephrine, adrenaline, etc. And all of these different neurotransmitters actually play a significant role in learning. Now, like I said, all this, a lot of this stuff is happening automatically or bottom up. Um, so these neurotransmitters are just being released in response to certain things happening in the environment or your circadian rhythms, etc. cetera. Um, but there are certain top-down behaviors that, or, that you can adopt to essentially trigger different neurotransmitters, the release of these different hormones such that you can optimize learning. So, okay, again, I'm gonna ground this in a specific personal example. So I'm learning how to play this very, very complex, stunning, harmonically difficult tune by Herbie Hancock called Dolphin Dance. Anyways, and um, in order to do this and to really get the most out of trying to learn it, there are a bunch of things I can do. So first, there is something called the circadian rhythm. You're probably familiar with it. Circa, dia means almost day. This is this 24 hour period and it has, uh, it's linked and associated with different kind of hormones being released at different times that make you more alert and awake and then make you more asleep, etc. Um, now there is, 
these 90 minute cycles inside your circadian rhythm called ultradian cycles or ultradian rhythms. And it turns out that learning bouts work really well in about 90 minutes. So when I'm sitting down to tackle the beast of, do of dolphin dance, I'm generally allocating 90 minutes. That seems to be more or less the optimal amount of period um, for your brain to absorb information and learn new skills. So I set 90 minutes aside, then what? Well, one of the keys to learning is alertness. That's the first key. Like you really want um, to be attentive, to have your energy at a certain level so you can focus. Now, sometimes when you're asleep, uh, there's certain kind of creativity that can percolate when you're sleepy and you're kind of dreamy, but really for learning, you really want to be alert. And so there are certain neurotransmitters associated with alertness. You know, you may want to allocate your learning session earlier in the day when your body's circadian rhythm is naturally uh, secreting cortisol. So cortisol makes you alert. Cortisol is a steroid hormone, steroid hormone uh, produced in the adrenal glands out of cholesterol and it, it crosses the blood brain barrier and like I said it makes you uh, alert. It gives you a certain amount of um, attentiveness. That you know we often associate cortisol with stress and while it is true that we do not want chronic overproduction of cortisol which can lead to uh, high glucose levels and then eventually potentially uh, diabetes if you're insulin resistant. Um, but a certain amount of cortisol is absolutely essential to life in general, but certain, certainly for being alert. Now there's another neurotransmitter that um, propagates uh, alertness and that's called epinephrine or adrenaline. They're essentially the same hormone. Um, adrenaline is produced also in the adrenal glands, epinephrine is produced in the brain, um, but they're essentially synonymous. So there are certain things that we can do uh, to trigger a certain amount of pulsing of epinephrine or adrenaline. And I'm going to tell you about what those things are because before I jump into my 90 minutes of learning, uh, I might want to engage in one of these activities to burst, boost or bolster my alertness. So one of them is breath work. We've probably heard of Wim Hof or Tumo breath work or breathing where you take 30 rapid inhales through your nose and exhales through your mouth. I, at least I always breathe in through my nostrils. Um, and then you do one long hold at the end. I'm not going to run through that whole process right now, but you kind of breathe up from your diaphragm. You want to do this in a safe place because someone you can pass out um, if you're not careful. But that has all sorts of positive physiological impacts. It actually produces uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines, which is good for your immune system and fighting off uh, infection and disease, but it also stimulates epinephrine. Um, another thing that you can do, also made famous by Wim Hof, is uh, cold water therapy or a cold shower or an ice bath. Um, that also produces epinephrine. It also produces, um, it's also really good at oxidation of adipose tissue, especially in low glucose states. Um, it stimulates your mitochondria to produce a lot of energy to upregulate your temperature because you're freezing cold um, and, uh, and that can burn uh, oxidized fatty acids. But the other thing that it really is great at is stimulating epinephrine and making you alert. The other thing that you can do is focus your eyes on a small um, object like the uh, eraser here and I'm like kind of bug eye on there and kind of my pupils get really big. Um, I am guarantee I'm the only jazz musician in history that does breath work, a cold shower, and bug eyes at an eraser before practicing. Um, but it makes sense because of course in fight or flight that's what you're doing. Your pupils get dilated. So what you're doing is you're kind of triggering a sort of 
small short burst of fight or flight, right? So the other last way of um, stimulating epinephrine for alertness is uh, an odd one, which is challenging your sense of balance. And I'll explain that this way. Um, your eyes have two primary functions. Uh, one I described briefly earlier is to uh, take in um, light waves and transmute it into electromagnetic magnetic signals and eventually images uh, such that you can perceive uh, the world as it is, supposedly. And um, the other is to set your circadian rhythm. Your ears also have two primary functions, one similar to the eyes to take in uh, waveforms and transmute those into sound waves um, or into sound. And the other is balance. So the vestibular system is located in your inner ear and um, in three-dimensional space, let's just say, you can reach forward, backwards, left, right, up, and down. And in your inner ear, you have this fluid, um, and it can essentially measure the tilt of your head in any one of those directions, and um, it um, interacts with a bunch of neurons to essentially maintain balance. But when you're let's say balancing on one leg, or if you're walking a balance beam, or you're doing a handstand, or something that you're really not used to, um, your vestibular system will trigger the release of a chemical bath, an elixir of neurotransmitters that turn out to be the perfect cocktail for, um, for learning. It releases uh, epinephrine, acetylcholine, and, um, and dopamine. And in a way, it really, really makes sense because think about if you were walking a slack line over a mountain pass, you would be highly alert and also highly focused. And that is the second key to learning. You have alertness and then you have focus. And because you don't want to be too jittery. You want energy, but you don't want that energy to be wild. Certainly when I'm playing a complicated tune that you know requires a lot of uh, dexterity and nimbleness in my fingers, I don't want to be kind of jittery. And this kind of can relate to coffee. Some people um, like to take in espresso shots prior to a learning bout. And that works for some people. I mean, just as a sidebar, what caffeine does is blocks adenosine receptors. Now, adenosine builds up in the body over the course of the day, and it makes you sort of imperceptibly more tired hour after hour. Um, caffeine, what it does is it blocks the adenosine receptors on cells. So you're not getting that tiredness and eventually then that wears off and you'll get a crash um, often, a caffeine crash. So you need to kind of experiment for yourself to find this balance between um, you know, energy and alertness and focus. And focus is, is highly associated with acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter. And really, when you think about it, what you're trying to hack is this perfect balance between your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. You're calm over here and you're alert over here. And it turns out that these combination of neurotransmitters is what really optimizes the aptitude for learning. You have epinephrine that is activating a neuron and making it ready to learn. And then you have acetylcholine that is marking that neuron for consolidation. Okay. So the last technique I would say, if you would want to call it that to optimizing learning is odd and unexpected. And that is to make mistakes. <laughs> and boy, does this one come easy for me? 
because you know I'll be learning you know this tune so okay I made a little mistake at the end there on that little line that's what I wanted to play but I will make a mistake over and over again and it turns out that the brain is really really good at mapping blunder <laughs> at really recognizing mistakes and this is where perseverance becomes part of learning and this is so cool because I will make that mistake I'll play that line incorrectly over and over again and then at some point I will nail it and my brain will recognize when I nail it and it will release a reward dollop of dopamine and that then completes this chemical bath of, uh, of neurotransmitters of epinephrine acetylcholine and dopamine that really round out the entire creation of that new neural connection and so you have alertness focus mistakes and perseverance but Skywalker you're not a Jedi yet because learning doesn't really codify or consolidate until later until sleep or until some form of deep rest like yoga nidra or some kind of deep meditation practice in which your mind is actually freer and it's more uh, meandering and wandering and this is when uh, memory or these connections really consolidate so then you have alertness uh, focus mistakes perseverance rest and those are the five essentials to optimizing learning now it must be said that neuroplasticity is generally seen as something super optimistic and hopeful and it is this idea that we can rewire connections and develop new neural networks in our brain is uh, is very very hopeful um, but at the same time you can also develop um, really destructive patterns and um, often from traumatic events and it, once you understand the neuroscience it actually becomes very very clear it is the actual attendance of adrenaline um, in at a traumatic event that makes it so memorable that consolidates it uh, in your brain so the good news is that we can engage in praxis and in, uh, in work to unwind some of this trauma some of these self-destructive patterns and I'll do um, another video potentially on, um, on that topic but the good news is is that we are not fixed of course we know this at a spiritual level that we're just a uh, pine cone bobbing down the river um, experiencing uh, phenomena moment to moment as it arises and, subs and subsides but the good news beyond that is that our brains um, are not fixed uh, they're adaptable they're malleable and I hope some of these techniques uh, give you the tools to optimize the creation of new neural networks <laughs>